Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about all of the books coming out in July of 2023. I apologize that this video is going up somewhat late. I typically try to get the new release videos out closer to the middle of the month so that you have plenty of time to kind of make a list on what you want to keep your eye on. As I've mentioned in past videos and as I'm probably going to mention in future videos, June was kind of a wash between starting a job at the Humane Society, which greatly decreased my ability to film and edit. On top of going on a cruise, which made it so I couldn't film or edit, I got extremely far behind in the filming and editing of my videos. And so right now I'm currently trying to play catch up and I hope that this this video is still useful to you. I'm going to do my best to try to get this out before the very first Tuesday in July. Tuesdays are typically the book release days, so I'm going to try to get this out by the first Tuesday of the month, which is July 4th. By now, I'm sure y'all know the drill. Every single month, I pick up to 20 new releases that I come on here to talk to y'all about. These are new releases that I have found interesting and are on my radar. They may be things that I've already added to my TBR, or they are things that I think you specifically will be interested in for one reason or another. This is not meant to be a comprehensive list, so I'm sure that there is a lot that I'm leaving off here that you may be excited about. So if there's anything that I've left out, please feel free to leave that information in the comments down below as I'm sure other people would love to hear. And of course, because I don't know too terribly much about these books, I will be reading blurbs about them or synopses about them just to give you an idea of what the books contain so you can make the decision on whether or not you want to add them to your TBR. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start with the releases coming out on July 4th. All right, so the very first book I'm going to talk to you about today that is coming out on the 4th is Rachel Solomon's new release called Business or pleasure. Rachel Solomon typically writes kind of romantic comedy type romances that are more of a good time than anything else. So this follows our main character Chandler Cohen. She has never felt more like the ghost in Ghostwriter until she attends a signing for a book she wrote and the author doesn't even recognize her. The evening turns more promising when she meets a charming man at the bar and immediately connects with him. But when all their sexual tension culminates in a spectacularly awkward hookup, she decides this is one night better off forgotten. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done. Her next project is ghostwriting a memoir for Finn Walsh, a C-list actor best known for playing a lovable nerd on a cult classic werewolf show who now makes a living appearing at fan conventions across the country. But Chandler knows him better from their one night stand of hilarious mishaps. Chandler's determined to keep their partnership as professional as possible, but when she admits to Finn their night together wasn't as mind blowing as he thought it was, he is distraught. He intrigues her enough that they strike a deal. When they're not working on his book, Chandler will school Finn in the art of satisfaction. As they grow closer both in and out of the bedroom, they must figure out which is more important, business or pleasure, or if there is a way for them to have both. Yeah, so this just sounds like it's going to be a good fun time. If you have enjoyed Rachel and Solomon in the past, this is one to keep your eye out for on July 4th. Another one coming out on the 4th is The Librarianist by Patrick DeWitt. This just sounds like it's going to be a tender, heartwarming time. It's going to have some harder hitting elements to it, but it also sounds like it's going to be a little bit lighthearted, charming, probably have a lot of comedic elements as well. It follows our main character, Bob Comet, who is a retired librarian, and he now kind of lives a very simple life in Portland, Oregon. And one day he is taking his daily walk and he stumbles upon a woman in the market who is elderly. She is confused. She doesn't really know where she is. And he ends up taking her back to her senior living facility. And while he's there, he decides that he actually wants to volunteer at the senior living facility. He thinks it's going to kind of like maybe fill a hole that is currently in his life. And while he's there, he meets a quirky cast of characters. But at the same time, you are also flashing back to his past and his time as a youth and during World War II and some of the mistakes and things that have happened to him in his life. It says, behind Bob Comet's straight man facade is the story of an unhappy child's runaway adventure during the last days of the Second World War, of true love won and stolen away, of the purpose and pride found in the librarian's vocation, and of the pleasure of a life lived to the side of the masses. Bob's experiences are imbued with melancholy, but also a bright, sustained comedy. He has a talent for locating bizarre and outsized players to welcome onto the stage of his life. It certainly sounds like there are a lot of elements to this. It definitely sounds like it's going to be character driven, which works for me as a character driven reader. I thought this just sounded very tender and heartwarming as well. And so I think I'm going to go ahead and add it to my TBR. This is one that I recently talked about as a potential book of the month selection for July. And I think if it is added as a selection, I may go ahead and add it to my box if I have room in it. Another one coming out on the 4th is The Sunset Crowd by Karen Tanabe. This is set in 1970s Hollywood. And so there's definitely very specific vibes to it, reminiscent kind of of Daisy Jones and the Six or maybe even Malibu Rising. Although the storylines for those books are likely very, very different from this one. It says The Sunset Crowd is a tale of survival 
revival and reinvention of faking it until you make it and the glittering appeal of success and stardom as it seeks to answer that timeless question, who gets to have the American dream? So from what I'm understanding after briefly reading the synopsis, it's following three different women. They have different roles and parts to play in Hollywood. One is the daughter of an Oscar winning director and she is also a style icon. You're also following a 20 something Paramount assistant who is desperate to become a producer. She wants to work behind the scenes and she is very ambitious. She's willing to do anything she can to get that part. And then you are following a photographer for Rolling Stone and Vogue and she seems to be connected to at least one of these perspectives. They're all likely going to connect in some fashion. I'm not entirely sure what the trajectory of this story is supposed to be, like what the ultimate point of it is. It sounds more like literary, historical fiction, character driven. So if this sounds like something you would be interested in, if you like the vibes of this story, this one is coming out on the 4th. And the final one that is coming out on the 4th that I want to talk to you about today is called A House for Good Children by Kate Collins. It sounds like this might have maybe a haunted house aspect to it. It says, once upon a time, Orla, a woman, a painter, a lover. Now she is a mother and a wife. And when her husband Nick suggests that their city apartment has grown too small for their lives, she agrees in part because she does agree and in part because she is too tired to think about what she really does want. She agrees again when Nick announces with pride that he has found an antiquated Georgian house on the Dorset Cliffs. A good house for children, he says. Tons of space and gorgeous grounds. But as the family settles into the mansion, Nick absent all week commuting to the city for work. Orla finds herself unsettled. She hears voices when no one is around. Doors open and close on their own and her son Sam, who has not spoken in six months, seems to have made an imaginary friend whose motives Orla does not trust. Four decades earlier, Lydia moves into the same house as a live-in nanny to a grieving family. Lydia too becomes aware of intangible presences in the large house and she, like Orla four decades later, become increasingly fearful for the safety of the children in her care. But no one in either woman's life believes the stories that seem fanciful. The stuff of magic and mayhem sprung from the imaginations of hysterical women who spend too much time in the company of children. Are both families careening towards tragedy? Are Orla and Lydia seeing things that aren't there? What secrets is the house hiding? This is considered a feminist gothic tale perfectly suited for the current moment. A Good House for Children combines an atmospheric mystery with resonant themes of motherhood, madness, and the value of a woman's work. So this actually sounds really good. I love that it's classified as a gothic novel. I really enjoy the atmosphere of a gothic novel. So this is certainly one that I have on my radar and I may ultimately end up adding this to my TBR. All right, moving on into the 11th, we have the newest release from Catherine Center called Hello Stranger. Catherine Center, again, is somebody who typically writes contemporary romance slash rom-com type novels, and this one doesn't seem to be any different. It follows a person named Sadie Montgomery. She is celebrating placing as a finalist in the North American Portrait Society, but one day she is lying in a hospital bed, suddenly diagnosed with a temporary, possibly, condition known as face blindness. So she can see faces, but when she sees them, they are all blurry, and she can't really recognize individual features. And as she struggles to cope while hanging on to her artistic dream, work through major family issues, and take care of her beloved dog, Peanut, she falls into love, lust, a temporary obsession to distract her from the real problems in her life, with not one man, but two very different ones. So you have a main character who's going through struggles. She's falling for two different guys. There's kind of going to be a love triangle aspect to this, which I don't love, but maybe she does it well. I'm not sure. I personally have only read one book from Catherine Center and I didn't love it. It was okay, but it didn't really do anything magical for me. So I haven't really been interested in any of her new releases. This one is no exception, but I do know a lot of people are big fans of her. This is another one that I predict could be a romance selection for book of the month coming out in July. So I did want to go ahead and mention it here in case you are a fan of Catherine Center. This one comes out on the 11th. Another one coming out on the 11th and one that I am personally excited about is The Paris Agent by Kelly Rimmer. I just read my very first Kelly Rimmer called The Things We Cannot Say and I really enjoyed that. I didn't know what to expect going in and it was really such a well-crafted World War II historical fiction and so I was very excited to see that she has a new release coming out in July. I believe this might follow female spies of some kind during World War II and that's like my favorite niche World War II subgenre is female spies. 1970. In the aftermath of his war-ravaged past, Noah Ainsworth is still haunted by memories of his time as a fearless British operative in France. But a critical head injury left Noah with frustrating memory gaps and a burning question that plagues him. Who was the agent who saved his life during that tragic final mission? Determined to find answers, Noah's daughter Charlotte embarks on a quest from their cozy home in Liverpool, leading her to the incredible lives of two ordinary women, Chloe and Fleur, who transformed into fearless spies on foreign soil. Yes. But as Charlotte unravels the heroic exploits of these women and their connection to Noah, she inadvertently stumbles upon evidence of a double agent lurking disturbingly close to home, drawing her into a treacherous web of secrets and unearthing a shocking story from those final days of war. Once again, Kelly Rimmer takes readers on a gripping journey, one that threads the lives of two remarkable women into the fabric of history, unveiling the power of courage, family, and the indelible mark left by the 
darkest era of human conflict. I am here for it. I'm excited about it. That sounds absolutely phenomenal. I think Kelly Rimmer has the potential to be one of my favorite historical fiction authors if all of the books that I read by her are as strong as the things that we cannot say. So I am certainly hyped for this one. It has already been added to my TBR. Also on the 11th is the newest release by Megan Collins called Thicker Than Water. It sounds like this is going to be a complicated thriller surrounding female friendship. It follows Julia and Sienna Larkin who are sisters-in-law and best friends connected by Julia's husband and Sienna's brother Jason. But they have been devoted best friends since Jason introduced them years ago. To Sienna, Jason can do no wrong. And although Julia knows he's not perfect, they built a comfortable life and family together. Recently, Jason has been putting in long hours to secure a promotion at work. So when his boss is found brutally murdered, his lips sewn shut, the Larkins are shocked and unsettled, especially as local gossip swirls. A few days later, Julia and Sienna's lives are appended when Jason gets into a car accident and is placed in a medically induced coma. Worse, the police arrive with news that he is a prime suspect in the murder investigation. With Jason unable to respond and with Julia and Sienna working to clear his name, the two women find their friendship threatened for the first time. Sienna staunchly maintains her brother's innocence, but as their investigation uncovers a complicated web of secrets, Julia is less sure she's willing to defend her husband. Okay, that actually sounds really, really interesting. So you have two women who are connected by one person, Jason, who is Sienna's brother and Julia's husband. And Sienna is very dedicated to her brother. She doesn't think that he could do anything wrong, but then his boss is murdered. He becomes the main suspect and now he's in a coma. He can't defend himself. He can't do anything. And so the two women take it upon themselves to help, but one woman is more convinced of his innocence than the other. So that sounds actually really interesting. I will say it's not getting the best reviews so far. It only has a 3.74 out of 388 ratings. So that's pretty mediocre overall. So I might keep my eye on this one and see if I hear anybody else talk about it. But the premise actually sounds pretty intriguing to me. Also on the 11th, one that was recently just brought to my attention is a new release from Darcy Coates called Dead of Winter. I only know of Darcy Coates because the people in Sid Bookworm's Patreon are big fans of hers. They recommend her a lot. And I recently just read a book by her called The Haunting of Ashburn House. This one seems like it's going to be a wintry isolation thriller, which you all know is my jam. And so I'm certainly willing to give this a shot. When Krista joins a tour group heading deep into the snowy expanse of the Rocky Mountains, she's hopeful this will be her chance to put the ghosts of her past to rest. But when a bitterly cold snowstorm sweeps the region, the small group is forced to take shelter in an abandoned hunting cabin. Despite the uncomfortably claustrophobic quarters and rapidly dropping temperature, Krista believes they'll be safe as they wait out the storm. She couldn't be more wrong. Deep in the night, the tour guide goes missing, only to be discovered the following morning, his severed head impaled on a tree outside the cabin. Terrified and completely isolated by the storm, Krista finds herself trapped with eight total strangers. One of them kills for sport, and they're far from finished. As the storm grows more dangerous, and the number of survivors dwindles one by one, Krista must decide who she can trust before this frozen mountain becomes her tomb. Definitely getting Agatha Christie, and then there were none aspects. And I'm curious to know if Darcy Coates will take a more supernatural twist to this, because The Haunting of Ashburn House, not to give any spoilers or anything, but that wasn't just a straight realistic story. There were speculative aspects to that. And so I'm wondering if that's going to be a part of this too, or I'm wondering if this is going to be like a more standard wintry isolation thriller, but I'm here for it either way. I'm really interested to see what she can do for this novel. So I'm certainly going to be keeping an eye on this one. Next on the 11th, we have The Bones of the Story by Carol Goodman. And after briefly reading through this, it sounds like it could be a little bit dark academia-esque, which I am absolutely here for. It is considered a twisty locked room mystery from two-time Mary Higgins Clark award-winning author Carol Goodman. It says, it's been 25 years since the shocking disappearance of a female student and the distinguished creative writing professor died while searching for her. The Briarwood College community has never forgotten the terrible storm that caused the double tragedy. Now, the college president, who has his own reasons for drawing attention to the notorious incident, is bringing together faculty, donors, and alumni to honor the victims from all those years ago. On a cold December weekend after the fall semester has ended, guests gather on the vacant campus for the commemoratory event. But as a winter storm descends, people begin to depart, leaving a group of alumni who were the last ones taught by the esteemed professor. Recriminations and old rivalries flare as they recall the writing projects they shared as classmates, including chilling horror stories they each wrote about their greatest fears. When an alumna dies in a shockingly similar way to the story she wrote, and then another succumbs to a similar fate, they realize someone has decided at long last to avenge the crimes of the past. Will the secret of what they did 25 years ago be revealed? Will any of them be alive at the end of the weekend to find out? All right, this sounds very, very interesting to me. It definitely sounds like we're combining dark academia, kind of like in my dreams, I hold a knife with a more isolated locked room type of setting, very Agatha Christie-esque. So again, we're seeing some of those similar tropes. I'm actually very, very intrigued by this one. Um, it's currently at a 3.99, but it only has 150 ratings. So that could go either way once it's released. I'm very, very tempted to add this one to my TBR. And the final one that I want to talk to you about that is coming out on the 11th is The Woods Are Waiting by Katherine Green. 
so this is supposed to be a suspense thriller which may have a slightly speculative aspect to it. It follows Cheyenne Ashby who knows the dark and disturbing history of her hometown of Blue Cliff, Virginia all too well. It's why she left. Growing up deep within the woods with her eccentric mother Constance, she was raised on the unusual customs and generational superstitions linked the local legend of an evil entity that haunts the forest. Five years ago the bodies of three children were found in the woods. It was a man, not a mythical beast, named Jasper Clinton who was convicted of these heinous crimes. For five years the town breathed just a bit easier with a real-life monster behind bars. But when another child goes missing, Cheyenne and Natalie are determined to discover the truth and uncover the town's dangerous secrets rooted in its terrifying past. The two women must confront the reality of the superstitions they always believed in and their town's complicated connection with who or what lives in the woods. So this is definitely supposed to make you think that it could be a supernatural force that's causing the death of these children and not a man. So this would be one to keep an eye out for on the 11th when it comes out. Moving on into the 18th, we have the newest release from Samantha Downing called A Twisted Love Story. This one sounds like it's going to follow a toxic relationship where a death happens at some point. It says Wes and Ivy are madly in love. They've never felt anything like it. It's the kind of romance people write stories about. But what kind of story? Because when it's good, it's great. Flowers, grand gestures, deep, meaningful conversations where the whole world disappears. But when it's bad, it's really bad. Vengeful fights, damaged property, arrest warrants. But their vicious cycle of catastrophic breakups and head over heels reconnections needs to end fast because suddenly Wes and Ivy have a common enemy and she's a detective. There's something Wes and Ivy never talk about in good times or bad. The night of their worst breakup when one of them took things too far, someone ended up dead. If they can stick together, they can survive anything, even the tightening net of a police investigation. So I admit that actually sounds really, really fascinating. You have two people who are in a very volatile up and down, back and forth, toxic relationship. And one night they had a catastrophic breakup and somebody winds up dead. And now there is a detective on their tails and they have to kind of stick together in order to prevent the detective from figuring out what happened. I am pretty intrigued by the synopsis of this one. Another release coming out on the 18th by an author I have never read, but she is certainly growing in popularity, is the newest release from Silvia Moreno-Garcia called Silver Nitrate. This is yet another one that I pegged as a potential book of the month prediction because it would be a repeat author from them. And like I said, she's getting pretty popular in the thriller horror genre. This one sounds a little bit kind of weird, which seems like it might be her thing. Montserrat has always been overlooked. She's a talented sound editor, but she's left out of the boys club running the film industry in 90s Mexico City. And she's all but invisible to her best friend Tristan, a charming if faded soap opera star, though she's been in love with him since childhood. Then Tristan discovers his new neighbor is the cult horror director Abel, and the legendary auteur claims he can change their lives. Even if his tale of a Nazi occultist imbuing magic into highly volatile silver nitrate stock sounds like sheer fantasy. The magic film was never finished, which is why Abel swears his career vanished overnight. He is cursed. Now the director wants Montserrat and Tristan to help him shoot the missing scene and lift the curse, but Montserrat soon notices a dark presence following her, and Tristan begins seeing the ghost of his ex-girlfriend. As they work together to unravel the mystery of the film and the obscure occultist who once roamed their city, Montserrat and Tristan may find that sorcerers and magic are not only the stuff of movies. Definitely sounds a little bit weird. Not really something that I'm personally interested in, but I know that a lot of people are big fans of Silvia Moreno-Garcia, so I wanted to go ahead and mention it here. Again, this comes out on the 18th. Also on the 18th is the newest book by Colson Whitehead, Crook Manifesto. This is the second book in his Ray Carney series. I believe the first book was Harlem Shuffle. This is another one that I don't really know too terribly much about because I've never read anything by Colson Whitehead. But again, he is an increasingly popular literary historical fiction author. These books are typically set in 1970s New York. This one is actually set in 1971, 73, and 76. So you're following furniture store owner and ex-fence Ray Carney who tries to keep his head down and his business thriving during very tumultuous times in 1970s New York where crime is at an all-time high. His days moving stolen goods around the city are over. It's strictly the straight and narrow for him until he needs Jackson 5 tickets for his daughter May and he decides to hit up his old police contact Munson, fixer extraordinaire. But Munson has his own favors to ask of Carney and staying out of the game gets a lot more complicated and deadly. 1973. The counterculture has created a new generation. The old ways are being overthrown but there is one constant, Pepper, Carney's endearingly violent partner in crime. It's getting harder to put together a reliable crew for hijackings, heists, and assorted felonies. So Pepper Pepper takes on a side gig doing security on a black exploitation shoot in Harlem. He finds himself in a freaky world of Hollywood stars, up and coming comedians, and celebrity drug dealers, in addition to the usual cast of hustlers, mobsters, and hitmen. These adversaries underestimate the seasoned crook to their regret. 1976. Harlem is burning block by block. While the whole country is gearing up for bicentennial celebrations, Carney is trying to come up with a July 4th ad he can live with. While his wife Elizabeth is campaigning for her childhood friend, the former assistant DA and rising politician Alexander Oakes. When a fire severely injures one of Carney's tenants, he enlist Pepper to look into who may be behind it. Our crooked duo have to battle their way through a crumbling metropolis run by the shady, the violent, and the utterly corrupted. So you have three different timelines, three 
different things happening. I'm not sure how they are all going to connect, but it definitely sounds interesting. So if you are a fan of Coulson Whitehead, you may want to go ahead and check this one out. Really quickly on the 18th, I did want to mention that A Soul of Ash and Blood is coming out by Jennifer L. Armentrout. That is the fifth book in her Blood and Ash series. I'm not going to read anything on the synopsis because if you haven't read the series or if you haven't read up to book four in the series, then there could be potential spoilers. I personally haven't read it, but I know that a lot of y'all are fans of this series. So I wanted to go ahead and mention it here in case you were not aware that the next book in the series is coming out soon. Another thriller that is coming out on the 18th is called The Block Party by Jamie Day. And I'm going to admit that this sounds really basic. It doesn't really do much for me, including the synopsis, um, but I'm going to go ahead and include it here because this is one that is actually getting a lot of buzz. A lot of people do think that this could be a book of the month selection, and I didn't include it in my predictions just because I don't want it to be. <laughs> this summer, meet your neighbors. The residents of the exclusive cul-de-sac on Alton Road are entangled in a web of secrets and scandal utterly unknown to the outside world and even to each other. On the night of the annual summer block party, there has been a murder. Ooh. But who did it and why take readers back one year earlier as rivalries and betrayals unfold, discovering that the real danger lies within their own block and nothing and no one is ever as it seems. So like I said, very vague, very basic. We have a wealthy community, so we have rich people behaving badly. Someone ends up dead. Everybody's hiding secrets. It just all sounds very overdone, done to death. No pun intended. And so I'm not really here for this one, but if I hear great things, maybe I could be convinced, but there's just nothing unique enough standing out about this story for me to want to go ahead and read it. But it is out there for you on the 18th if you are interested. All right, that was actually the last book coming out on the 18th. So we're moving on into the final week of releases in July. It is going to be the 25th of July. And once again, I just really quickly wanted to reference that Lightbringer by Pierce Brown is coming out on the 25th. This is the sixth book in his Red Rising saga. Again, another series that I don't read. I don't have any interest in reading, but I know a lot of people are huge fans of this series. And so if you were not aware, this book is coming out on the 25th. Again, not going to read anything about about what the synopsis is to avoid spoilers. This is just a notification for those who love the series and may not be aware that this next book is coming out. On the 25th, we have Sherry Lapina's new release, Everyone Here is Lying. This sounds like it's going to be another domestic suspense. It follows William Wooler. He is a family man on the surface, but he's been having an affair, an affair that ended horribly this afternoon at a motel up the road. So when he returns to his house, devastated and angry to find his difficult nine-year-old daughter Avery unexpectedly home from school, William loses his temper. Hours later, Avery's family declares her missing. Suddenly, Stanhope doesn't feel so safe, and William isn't the only one on his street who's hiding a lie. As witnesses come forward with information that may or may not be true, Avery's neighbors become increasingly unhinged. Who took Avery Wooler? For those who do like Sherry Lapina, this again is coming out on the 25th. Chloe Gong also has a new release coming out on the 25th. It is called Immortal Longings, and it is actually her adult fantasy debut. She typically writes young adult fantasy, I believe. I haven't actually read anything by her, so I'm not crazy familiar with her work or what she writes about, but I do believe this is her adult fantasy debut. So I wanted to mention it here in case you are a fan of Chloe Gong's young adult work. This definitely sounds like it has a lot of aspects that are really popular in fantasy. There is going to be a competition aspect to it. There also is going to be a princess who is out for revenge. She's out to kill a few people or maybe not even revenge, but she's out for a political motive. She's out to kill some people. Then there, of course, there are people that she's allying with. It says, inspired by Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra in a fiery collision of power plays spilled blood and romance amidst a set of deadly games. That's what this book is about. Please go ahead and check this out if this one sounds interesting to you or if you are a fan of Chloe Gong and have read some of her work in the past. So another one coming out on the 25th is called Her Little Flowers by Shannon Morgan. I also believe that this is a debut. Francine Thwaite has lived all her 55 years in her family's ancestral home, a rambling Elizabethan manor in England's Lake District. No other living soul resides there, but Francine isn't alone. There are ghosts in Thwaite Manor, harmless and familiar, most beloved of it is Brie, the mischievous ghost girl who has been Francine's companion since childhood. When Francine's estranged sister Madeline returns to the manor after years away, she brings with her a story that threatens everything Francine has always believed. It is a tale of cruelty and desperation, of terror and unbearable heartache. And as Francine learns more about the darkness in her family's past and the role she may have played in it, she realizes that confronting the truth may mean losing what she holds most dear. So this synopsis I feel like is very vague. I'm not entirely sure what the overall plot of the story is supposed to be. You're definitely getting a haunted mansion 
attention. It sounds like you're getting complicated family dynamics and possibly some family secrets, but I'm not sure what the overall point and purpose of the story is supposed to be. But it definitely sounds like it could be atmospheric, a little bit haunting, spooky. So if it sounds up your alley, this might be one to check out if you like these types of stories, because I'm definitely getting some similar vibes, maybe a little bit to Simone St. James, possibly a little bit of Riley Sager, maybe even into Darcy Coates. I'm not entirely sure. But if you like any of those stories, those authors, this may be one to check out. And then the final one I wanted to talk to you about today coming out on the 25th is one that I am personally very excited for. It is I Did It For You by Amy Engel. Amy Engel is not an author that I hear talked about online hardly at all, but I absolutely loved her Southern Gothic story called The Roanoke Girls. Definitely a deeply disturbing story, but I loved it. I ate it up. I also enjoyed The Familiar Dark by her, not nearly as much as The Roanoke Girls, but still it was a solidly messed up time. And so I am interested to see what this new release is all about. It has been a while since her latest release and I am here for it. This says it's been 14 years since Greer Dunning's older sister Eliza was murdered and Greer's family has never been the same. And now there's been a similar killing in Greer's small Kansas hometown after the execution of the convicted killer. Okay, so we might have a wrongful conviction going on here. A copycat according to the authorities, but Greer is convinced there is more to the story that Eliza's murderer had helped all those years ago. Okay, so maybe not an innocent man was convicted, but somebody who had a partner. So there's still somebody out there. Greer returns to Ludlow after more than a decade away, desperate to find answers to the questions that have haunted her for years. Her drive to uncover the truth pushes her to form a bond with the unlikeliest of allies. At once a riveting mystery and a deep exploration of guilt, loss, and the ways in which a violent murder transforms both the family of the victim and the family of the killer. I did it for you. will keep readers captivated through the very last page. So I absolutely love the sound of that. Like I said, I think Amy Engel does dark and messed up really, really well so far from what I've been able to see in her writing. And I am hyped for this one. This is absolutely going on my TBR. I would love to read this as soon as I possibly can. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I wanted to spotlight that are coming out in the month of July. Again, to reiterate, this list is not meant to be comprehensive. It is meant to be just a curated list of 20 or so new releases that I feel you may be interested in and some that I am interested in as well. If you made it to the end of this video, go ahead and leave me like a haunted house emoji. I feel like there were two or three books in this list that definitely had some type of haunted house vibes to it. So go ahead and leave me a haunted house emoji or some type of spooky emoji, whatever you can find. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I can do. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.